It's two past the hour. It's Nathan Ost here. Um, we'll get this presentation on a roll. Um, so, no further ado. Uh, my name is Nathan Ost. I am I am a, a principal consultant in toxicology and risk assessment here in Australia. And um, as you probably noticed, I'm here to talk about the project that we undertook, which was the review of the Australian workplace exposure standards. So I'm going to move forward, um, sit back and enjoy. Um, actually, first off, I should have mentioned, please enter any questions in the question box. Um, the questions will be read out by the organisers and will be discussed at the end of the presentation. Thanks. So first off, um, what is a workplace exposure standard? So it is a, an airborne concentration of a chemical substance that should not cause adverse health effects or undue discomfort. Um, there are uh, different names used for these around the world, such as occupational exposure level or threshold limit value. But I'm, I'm going to use the term workplace exposure standard or exposure standard throughout this presentation. So this, uh, the project overview, overview, okay, who was the client? The client was Safe Work Australia. And they are an, an Australian government statutory body that develops national workplace health and safety policy. Um, and part of their work is developing and implementing uh, work, workplace exposure standards. Um, what was the scope? Our scope, WSP's scope was to review and update Australia's exposure standards and advisory no notations for over 700 hazardous chemicals that can be found in the uh, workplace. Um, why was this happening? Why was, why was this project implemented? Um, Australia's exposure standards were, were first adopted in around 1995, and, but since then, the toxicological and epidemiological data underpinning those exposure standards had progressed and, and some maybe have been outdated. And this meant that workers potentially faced an increased risk of illness and disease from exposure to workplace ex hazardous chemicals. And, and was this fact that was a driving factor in, in this wholesale, wholesale review project. Um, some individual chemicals had previously undergone review since the 90s, but uh, it was taken an ad hoc, non-standardized approach. And it was, it's quite, it was a, the, the methodology was quite time consuming. Um, we had a budget of approximately 1.2 million Australian dollars. Uh, we had around a year to complete this 12 months and, and of note was the great collaboration between WSP Australian, uh, um, Australian and Can Canadian teams. So what did we do? We produced around 726, 700 of these reports. And these, these reports, um, this is just an example here. These reports are uh, publicly available and contain all the relevant information used to derive the exposure standard for the particular chemical. In this case, it's chromium. It's this example of hexavalent chromium. So these, these reports uh, could be used by uh, industry occupational hygienists or industrial hygienists and, and the community for quick reference and to understand the science, that, uh, the evidence behind why the, the number is what it is. So the front page here, this is this page on the left, uh, provides all the summary information of the chemical up here, the actual exposure standard that we recommend, some notations, um, the critical effect here for hexavalent chromium, the critical effect is cancer. I'll expand on critical effect later. Um, also a summary of the ev evidence used to come up with that number. Uh, the appendix here, there, was, uh, there were more appendixes, but um, obviously couldn't fit them in on the slide. Um, the appendix had all the relevant information and data from uh, the primary and secondary data sources. And I'll expand on those a bit later as well. So we produced over 700 of these documents with all this uh, scientific information in just over a year pandemic impacted. Um, and as, as you can imagine, this was a pretty big undertaking involving um, some complexities, not only in the science as scientific aspects, but project management, data, file handling, et cetera. 
So how did we accomplish that? How did we do it? Do it? Um, w, WSP in Australia pulled together a stellar team. That's that's the main point here, and and they're listed here. Most of them listed here. All of them are listed here in this slide. Um, the Australian team, which are the the, the first six here, um, were uh, members from across different WSP office, offices across the nation, across Australia. We also had the addition of uh, the welcome addition of our Canadian teammates, to Teresa Ripasso Subang and her team to help with the evaluations. Um, we had uh, great communication and, 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 a, and a beautiful relationship built with Jackie Shepard, the then director of the occupational hygiene team from South, uh, from Safe Work Australia. Um, we also had peer reviews undertaken by uh, Peter DeMarco, he was assigned by Safe Work Australia. He is the current president of the International Union of Toxicology and a toxicology expert here in Australia, and also the um, relentless and uh, uh, invaluable support from our support staff. So the overall aim of the project was to develop health-based exposure standards and, and advisory notations based on the, the highest quality contemporary evidence, not the outdated stuff. And, and it, it was supported by a rigorous scientific approach with the overarching ob objective to minimize the risk of ill health in Australian workers. Um, in Australian exposure standard for a particular chemical uh, sets out the legal concentration limit that it, of, of that particular chemical that must not be exceeded. And businesses in Australia must ensure that no person is exposed to airborne concentrations of that particular chemical above the exposure standard at the workplace. So that's the overarching aims. Now, the development of, of an exposure standard, in general, from a, from the um, from an agency's perspective, from the, from a, someone like SafeWorks perspective, takes three main steps, which is one over here is produce the, the value, the number, use the science, come up with a protective number. Uh, the second step is uh, st stakeholder consultation review, get all the comments, is it is it you know feasible, et cetera, and then uh, approve and implement that across um, industry and the nation. WSP were involved in, our, our objective was to come up with the numbers, the science, uh, uh, it, Looking at the science, come up with the um, um, concentrations. We weren't, we didn't run these parts of the project. We we would answer some sticky questions from stakeholders in regards to the science, but that's as far as we got in in that part of the um the the overall process of developing these exposure standards. Again, um, just to recap, and uh, what is an exposure standard? It's the airborne concentration with a within a worker's breathing zone of that particular chemical substance, substance that should not cause adverse health effects or um, undue comfort. And they typically come in three forms. Exposure standards typically, typically come in three forms. Um, the time weighted average or the TWA applies to long-term exposure to a substance over an eight hour working shift for a five day working week over entire working life. The short-term exposure limit or STEL is is another time weighted average, but that's an average over a 15 minute period. Um, and I think that can't be uh, four times at, uh, over a working shift um, it is what the STEL applies to. The peak limitation is a maximum exposure, not, not a time weighted average. It's also known as a ceiling. And, and this shouldn't be exceeded any, at any time during a, sh during a shift. So there's these three forms. Um, the form of the exposure standard assigned to a particular chemical hazard depends on its interest, intrinsic toxic properties. Do the effects happen quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So that would dictate what form a chemical will have or combination. A, chem, a chemical can have one, um, a combination of these. Uh, just some historical aspects. Where do they come from with the industrial revolution? For new complex machinery, um, industry types chemicals, and we started to we started to recognise that exposure to airborne chemical hazards can result in ill health, and with that we started to realise that maybe we should start protecting workers 
and um, uh, I think it's around 140 years ago, an exposure limit for um, carbon monoxide was produced. And this was the uh, first of many in the growing list that, that grew with our knowledge and, and as, as technology grew. grew, grew. Um, most exposure to airborne, this, this seems quite logical, most ex exposed airborne chemicals happens when workers inhale vapors, dust, fumes or gases. So that, that's what we're dealing with, vapors, dust, fumes or gases. Um, but absorption through the skin can also be a significant source of exposure for some chemicals. And how much a worker is exposed or uptakes or, or absorbs depends on the, the concentration of the chemical in the air, the amount of time or duration that the, that the person is exposed and the effectiveness of controls. Um, not many controls used in these images here. So that's sort of so, uh, a bit of a historical aspect. Um, small slide on the tox toxicological factors. Um, quick slide. When breathed in, some uh, over here on the left, some um, airborne chemicals can impact the respiratory system directly at the point of contact, the upper respiratory system, the nose, the throat, the lungs. Uh, that's the lower part. Um, and uh, they impact the system directly at the point of contact. And this is what we call a local effect, where it touches the body. But some chemicals can be absorbed and distributed to other parts of the body and causing their effect in other tissues and, and, and organs. And, and this is a systemic effect. Um, exposure to chemicals cause, can cause immediate acute health effects, such as the irritation, or it could be years or decades before effects um, become evident. Um, e effects may be less severe and reversible. Reversible is a key point here, such as irritation, which means that the effect disappears once a person is no longer exposed or they're uh, um, taken out of the exposure. Um, but some effects are more severe and irreversible, such as cancer, which meaning that the disease remains and, and maybe even grows after after exposure is, um, after the, the person is no longer exposed. Uh, one key concept in the, as we move forward and talk about the derivation of the numbers, um, one key concept is the critical effect. Uh, we need to understand the critical effect from a particular chemical. And the critical effect is the most sensitive adverse effect that occurs at the lowest airborne concentration or dose. The critical effect might be irritation if the chemical causes both, if the if irritation is stopped at a concentration less than what causes cancer. I hope that sort of makes some sense. So critical effect is the key term. Uh, this is a bit of a busy slide. I won't go into this too much actually. This is just an example of what we call a dose response curve for a non-threshold chemical. Um, it's exposure here on the x-axis at the bottom, the response, so exposure, or concentration or dose, that's why it's called a dose response curve. There's a response, um, some data points, but look, look, I won't go into that too much. It's um, a bit busy there. We can talk about that at another time, just running out of time here. Okay, so the art of deriving an exposure standard. This is this is here is the expo uh, is the traditional approach. Um, you see, this takes two or three months, two to three months or more. So the, with a traditional approach, we assemble all the relevant data from animal studies, human studies, whatever is available, and we assemble all that data on the hazards of that particular substance. Um, a, a literature review, a large comprehensive literature review, and we have to determine what the effects and at what dose or concentration those effects occur. We then evaluate and look for the critical effect. Is it ha does it have a threshold or non-threshold? Um, once we identify the, the critical effect, we need to evaluate that dose response data and then come up with uh, a numerical value. Um, again, this could take depending on the chemical and how much information needs to be interrogated, it can take two to three months or more. And that's just coming up with a number, not, not, not stakeholder review and um, implementation. Um, so the process, the traditional, the traditional process of coming up with an exposure stand number requires um, a consideration of a range of factors and it's pretty labor and resource intensive endeavor, especially 
for over 700 chemicals as was this project, but we didn't use this previous traditional um, approach here. We didn't use this approach. We used a, a, a streamlined methodology. Um, so to ensure efficient reviews for the project, Safe Oak Australia developed a streamlined methodology that meant the data we reviewed came from designated trusted source agencies, and I'll, I'll, I'll list them a bit later. And these agencies had already undertaken these comprehensive reviews of the data. Um, so we had two lists of sources that we could use, and these were categorized as primary and or secondary data sources. So we did not undertake the extensive reviews of the broader literature up, up here. Um, we were limited to these primary and, and secondary data sources from trusted uh, agencies and didn't take the extensive review of the literature for two reasons. Um, the primary and secondary data sources were from trusted, as, as I said a few times now, trusted sources had, and they had already done the reviews. Um, uh, and the second, the second reason was to ensure a standardised and efficient review process. So the same uh, uh, data application was applied across every chemical. So in short, the methodology skipped looking at th these individual regional toxicology and epidemiological studies and used the review documents. And um, the timeframes scaled down a fair bit. These are around one to two days once, once we had the condensed comprehensive reviews to look at. So this here is the list of the primary sources of data that we use and, and the data from this, the evidence from these, the, these reviews formed the basis of the decision making for us to come up with a number. We didn't just adopt their numbers. We still interrogated the, the science that they used um, to derive a number. Sometimes it would be this, the same number, but sometimes it wasn't. Um, we sometimes couldn't get all the relevant information that we needed and there was some um, uncertainty. So we had a, the um, secondary source data. So this is the list of the secondary sources of data that we we consulted during the evaluation process to confirm or clarify detail or particularly to resolve any uncertainty in coming up with um, uh, an, a number for the particular chemical of interest. Remember, we're talking about 700 chemicals, 700 plus chemicals. So primary and so secondary data sources. Um, if we couldn't resolve the uncertainty with these sources of data, one of our options was to recommend an interim workplace exposure standard with another recommendation that a priority or more um, comprehensive review be undertaken for that particular chemical at either the next review period or um, immediately or within um, a short amount of time. Again, here's the documents that we produced, the front page, was the summary information with all the all the, the science and the data um, underpinning our decisions, our recommendations in in the in the appendices. Much time have I got coming close now? Okay. Um, the recommendations that we made for the particular values were based on the av av available toxicological and epidemiological data, and I must know that we we did not take into account the practicality or feasibility considerations such, such as measurability. Was the value below the industry uh, ability to measure it? That part of the process would be, is being handled in the stakeholder engagement. We, were, we focused on the, um, the science behind, the health-based science behind the numbers, as was our um, um, scope. Uh, once we had, evaluated the, da the data for a particular chemical. We had four options for recommendation for the number. We could retain or keep the number, um, the original older number. Older, it, it's, uh, our recommendation still had to be um, supported by the, the data that we reviewed. We could, re we could amend with a new number, either higher or lower, again, depending on the evidence that we with 
that we um, reviewed, we could withdraw, and that usually is um, if the chemical was rare or not used within Australian um, industries or, or, or labs anymore. And as mentioned, we could also recommend an interim if the um, evidence wasn't, um, there was some uncertainty, still some uncertainty with the recommendation for the in-depth or priority review. Okay, last slide, key, key takeaways. Um, the project was delivered on time and within budget, even with the pandemic disruptions, which we all experienced. Um, it was an example of a successful collaboration between international WSP teams. It was a great demonstration of um, our technical expertise and project management capabilities, great teamwork. And we are uh, all quite proud to have contributed to such an important project for Australia and insisted uh, and, and assisted in reducing the risks of ill health for current and future workers. And with that, that's the end of my um, discussion. So I'll hand that over to Karina now. Thank you very much, Nathan, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, so um, I have a first uh, question for you. Can you expand a little on threshold and non-threshold chemicals and what the term means? Okay, sure. The um, So I, I, I put that uh, dose response curve up before. It's a bit hard to do with that, with that visual, but a, thresh, uh, a threshold chemical has, as a name, alludes to a threshold. So there is a concentration above zero at which effects have not observed, say 10 micrograms per meter cubed or 10 parts per, me, parts per million. That's a concentration in air. So let's say, at, for example, at 10, within the, the, the studies, say either in animals and or humans or both, there, is, there are no effects or no adverse effects at concentrations below that, that number 10. So, so that's the threshold. A non-threshold, is usually associated with carcinogens, ca cancer causing agents. And the at any concentration, there is a risk, a risk of, of um, cancer. So at 0.001, there's a, there's a minute risk of, of cancer that that chemical may cause. So as the name alludes, there's a uh, threshold, has a threshold, non-threshold, the, the dose response curve goes through the zero point. I hope that sort of um, helps with that. Very good. What is meant by a skin advisory notation? Uh, okay, I, I didn't. I did note. Um, I did mention that we we also um, did advisory notation. So the skin advisory notation. I mentioned that some chemicals exert their effects once you breathe it in but some can be absorbed by the skin and um, have a, I mentioned the systemic effects. So they, the, not just breathe in, they can be absorbed by the skin and contribute to the disease. So a, a, a chemical that is readily absorbed by the skin that may contribute to the disease, a critical effect or any other effect that we're trying to uh, prevent gets a skin no, um, uh, um, advisory notation. And that was similar for, uh, there's carcinogen note, um, uh, carcinogen and sensitization as well. That's that question, Karina. Yeah, next question. How often does Safe Work Australia plan to review the exposure standards? Um, as far as I understand, I think there will be, uh, the, the next set of reviews probably wouldn't be as intensive as ours because it was the first time in, in 20 or so years. Um, as far as I understand, I'm pretty sure it's five years, um, it, it's five years, yeah, somewhere between five to 10 years that they will start looking at the, the, the list again, other than those, um, 
chemicals that we deemed interim and needing um, priority review. Very good. At the beginning of your presentation, uh, you showed some uh, reports and we have a question related to when will these reports be available? The report, the, the um, draft reports are available now on the Safe Work Australia website. The Engage, I think it's Engage uh, website, They're, they are available. They have just finished the stakeholder um, engagement. Um, so they're available now to answer that question. Very good. Next question. Were there any notable notable large reductions in the WES? Ah, uh, yes, there was, and some were, were quite controversial um, for some particular chemicals. There's, there's some um, um, interesting conversations in and around that. So for some there was, some there wasn't. Uh, some stayed the same. Um, Notable was oh, um, isocyanates. That was a not notable reduction due to the fact that um, it had the potential to cause asthma or, or um, uh, propagate asthma in those people that already had it. Um, some actually were um, expanded. So yes, there were some notable large reductions, particularly isocyanates and a couple of others. I think hexavalent chromium as well. Thank you. Next question. How did WSP receive the mandate from Safe Work Australia to undergo this comprehensive WS review? Was it like for, through a tender process? And there is a ah, second correct. part to the question. Ah, yep. what, oh, was, see, yep. what was Sorry, the agency? Sorry. What was the agency's rationale for undergo undergoing this review at the time? Um, yes, there was a tender process. Um, WSP actually did not get the project first off. Uh, University in Australia did. They started the process, but um, it became evident that it might, they um, it was they possibly would, were not up for the job. Um, uh, WSB Australia were then offered the the, the project, um, and we got in and, and completed it as per scope. Um, and the agency's rationale was the fact that the the WES at the time the uh, the WES meaning the exposure standards, the workplace exposure standards at the time were based on um, potentially outdated uh, um, scientific evidence, which um, meant there was a risk to Ill, of ill health for Australian workers. That was the rationale. Very good. Last question. We reached uh, almost the end. How will the WES be communicated? Um, there, as far as I understand, Safe Work Australia produce a list um, of all the chemicals. They had a list prior. They, there's a list that you can access via the website. Um, I'm sure through their other communication outlets, um, but there is a list where you can look up each individual chemical with an easy search um, via the website and through the usual industry um, communication processes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nathan, for this excellent presentation. Thank you to all our participants for joining us today. We're going to wrap up the webinar now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.